All right, it's uh, April the 22nd, 2021. This is Brother Smith from Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, this is our Thursday night Bible study at 7 p.m. And um, if anyone has any questions, of course, you can comment on here, but uh, you can also send, I put a post it in on there. You can send questions to my email address, ifrsmith at aol.com. For those that's maybe watching the video later and uh, the recording. And so I'm just going to take a little time here and give people time to get on. Um, it's been a pretty day here in the <clears throat> Uh, great state of Arkansas, Little Rock, the capital, and uh, it's been a pretty day. And it's been a little bit chilly in the mornings, but uh, I think that's going to be about over next week after we have a little bit of rain over the weekend. But anyway, um, we'll just give this here a few minutes and let, let, give people a little bit of time to get on. So um, if you need to grab you a cup of coffee or something to drink. Uh, we'll get started with our Bible study here in a few minutes after folks begin to log on to the channel. Oh, okay. Maybe there is people on here. I didn't realize anybody was on. Um, so, I was trying to give people just a few minutes to get on, but it looks like people are already getting on. So, I want to welcome all of you and thank you for uh, uh, giving me opportunity to share my heart with you tonight. And... Um, so <clears throat> I'll just, uh, let's see, what can I tell you? We do need, we do have some prayer requests to Brother Majesty in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Actually, he's in, in Naples. He he's works under Brother Yvonne George's. He's had a major heart attack. He's been in the hospital about three weeks, and he's really <clears throat> never a gained conscious back I don't believe and uh, so they're still hoping that he will uh, they did do heart surgery on him but he's never really came that came out of it so please pray for Brother Majesty the pastor of Naples Florida Assembly uh, Brother and Sister Weaver here in Little Rock uh, we're still working on their house trying to get uh, they had a burn, their house caught on fire and, and uh, destroyed the bathroom and hallway. Thank the Lord, it was they were able to get it out before it destroyed the house. But we're having trouble getting, you know, permits all done and getting all the work done and back into it. And then Brother Weaver, of course, had a uh, kidney removed, and so they certainly need our prayers. Um, Pray for the work in the Dominican Republic and other works abroad um, in Puerto Rico. And Brother Fidel in Guatemala is always asking for prayer. Uh, I'm sure all the missionary works are certainly in need of prayer right now. It's, no one's been able to travel to them. and so. But the Lord's blessed us with these Zoom meetings that we've been having. And uh, <clears throat> then the praise report. Uh, brother Phil Fisher and Sister Chelsea Fisher, their new baby Mallory, they just uh, they were in the hospital about three hours today with tests with Mallory and and just got some really good results to the test and they they just uh, were elated with everything and and uh, the baby's just 
improved and I'm going to leave it to them to be able to announce all the good news rather than me take that away from them. But anyway, good praise report there. So everybody keep praying for little Mallory. Um, uh, let's see, I was just trying to think if there's anything else. Of course, uh, Brother Michael and Sister Cindy, Cindy's mother, uh, is there in Camden with them right now. And, and uh, so... Sister Angie Elder, keep her in your prayers. That, uh, the Lord to just keep touching her and her health would improve. And, and uh, you know, there's none of us that mind so much getting old, older, I should say, if our health don't fail us. And, of course, that's the problem is the older we get, it seems like we have more health issues. And so, but... Let's pray, you know, God's children can uh, uh, be on the blessing side of things of the Lord. And so, and Sister Angie Elder, I certainly feel that she's worthy of God's touch in her life. So let's keep her in our prayers also. Um, I want to talk to you tonight, maybe on, you know, uh, maybe... Uh, I hope this will be something that will interest you, something I haven't talked a whole lot on. It's, yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit about the the uh, thousand year millennial reign. And uh, that's not something we talk about a lot because it's not something we know a whole lot about. But I feel like, uh, you know, there's some things about it that's been interesting to me. And of course, we always wanting to and we're all of interest of knowing what, what the Lord is going to do, what's going to be like in the future. It's so difficult to try to determine, you know, what's heaven going to be like, what's living throughout eternity going to be like. Uh, uh, you know, I've had every saints of all different uh, ideas in, in themselves. Excuse me, maybe... Uh, like I've had saints, uh, I've had husband and wives not go, not want to go to he heaven because they found out that they can't be married in heaven to the same spouse. <laughs> um, you know, if uh, they can't have the fa same family relationship they've got here on earth, you know, uh, they don't want to go to heaven if it's going to be different. All kinds of ideas that people have. <laughs> Let me just tell you this. We may not know exactly. Uh, I know the Bible does say we'll be known as we are known. And uh, I know you're not given in marriage in heaven. Uh, we're equal to the angels, Jesus said. And he meant by that not equal in, in uh, physical uh, makeup because we will be humans with a glorified body, but um, those that are in the bride, uh, they won't be as, as the angels exactly because we're of a different makeup. The angels have never been humans. But uh, let me just tell you this. If you like life and you enjoy life, you're going to enjoy life eternal uh, where there's no sweat of your brow. There's no... Um, there's no curse. There's no elements that would be uh, detrimental. Uh, you know, it's just, it's hard to fathom all of that. But I can just tell you, for me, I love this life. I love life. I love being a part of God's kingdom. And I love being a part of his creation. And, and uh, so his creation is, is to me, it's glorious. <laughs> And how much more will it be in, in that world where all of these things that have been a hindrance because of sin exist? And so I'll just say this to you. If you like life, you're going to love, you're going to love eternity, life and eternity. I don't know what it's going to be like altogether, but I just know it's going to be better than what we have now. And I'm not willing to trade what I have now for death. Uh, you know, 
I love being a part of what God is doing. And uh, so anyway, here's what I want to say to you a little bit about the, at least the beginning part of uh, the thousand year millennial reign. If you'll remember, I've talked to you some about um, Elijah, uh, the type of Elijah. For you to understand that, that the type of Elijah, that type is a type of the ministry of the New Testament church that started on the day of Pentecost, or actually even before when Jesus said that Elijah had already come. They did ask uh, John the Baptist if he was Elijah, and he said no. He said, well, who are you? He said, I'm the one, the voice of him that's speaking in the wilderness and making straight the paths of the Lord. Uh, but the but when Jesus said he had come, he meant the type uh, that God put in the Old Testament of Elijah. And I went through that type and taught it before. Uh, those of you that maybe haven't had the opportunity to hear that message, um, I, I'm not going to go through it all here tonight because I wouldn't get through but um, I'll just say this, that um, you know, there was a famine in the land and, and uh, Elijah prophesied that famine. Uh, and it was for three and a half years. It, it represented the, the uh, wilderness wanderings of the Gentiles, dark ages, basically when Catholicism was in uh, full swing and in control as a, as a dragon power in the world from 538 to 1798 AD. And, um, and then when the famine was over and Elijah uh, met with the prophets of Baal and Ashereth on Mount Carmel, and uh, there was offerings, sacrifice offerings by those prophets of Baal and Ashereth, and uh, Elisha had said, um, y'all go ahead and offer up your sacrifice to your God, and I'll offer to my God, and whichever God responds, whichever God receives our sacrifice, we'll know it's the true God. And of course, if you, yeah, I'm sure most of you know the story, God, the God of Baal and Ashereth did not answer uh, or respond to their sacrifice. But at the time of the evening sacrifice, uh, no doubt Elijah knew when God would accept a sacrifice and when the time of the sacrifice would be. And so uh, God accepted his sacrifice and then he killed uh the prophets of Baal and Ashereth there on Mount Carmel, Elijah did. And Jezebel, when she uh, learned what he did, she said, uh, if I don't kill you like you killed my prophets, you know, she she let him know you're, you're going to die. I'm going to kill you. And um, so <laughs> he, he ran. He took off running. And he ran from... Um, he ran and laid down under a juniper tree. He uh, went to sleep. I've often said that was a, a picture of the word of God that the reformers, this is a picture of the reformers challenging the beast system uh, back there, uh, the Roman system and the papacy. And so... Uh, <clears throat> When those reformers, of course, there was uh, Martin Luther had a death warrant out on him. You know, the, the Catholic Church wanted to kill him as a heretic, and but he he ran and laid under a juniper tree, and that's where he found rest. That juniper tree is an evergreen; it represents the Word of God. I guess I am kind of quickly going through this, and an angel woke him up, and there was a a cruise of water and a in that little cake there, an angel told him to eat it and drink. And he did, and he went back to sleep. 
And the angel woke him up again. There was another cake and another cruise of water. He said, eat and drink. He said, you're going to need this for the journey that God was sending him to Mount Horeb. And those two, I, I've often said and taught that those two feedings represented the Protestant movement, which was in the earlier Reformation period, and the Pentecostal movement. And uh, that those two movements of God's restoration has brought us to where we are. And that's what Elijah needed to get to Mount, Mount Horeb. And of course, there was first strong winds that blew against the mountain, broke the rocks against the mountain. There was an earthquake that shook the mountain. And then there was fire and smoke. And, uh, you know, these things represented the, the, the full winds shaking the world. Right now, I say the world is shaken. The winds are blowing. The political winds, the monetary winds, the religious winds, um, the social winds. Uh, all of these winds are blowing and it's, it's, it's breaking up governments. It's breaking up religions. It's, it's breaking up social powers, political powers, uh, military powers. And then an earthquake is coming. And of course, I believe that that earthquake represents uh, the fall of America. I think America will fall. I think it will be judged. This country has turned away from God. And the Bible does say when a nation uh, turns against God, away from God, it'll be turned into hell. This nation deserves more judgment than any other nation in the Gentile world because it's been blessed by God more than any other nation. And this nation knows better than to turn away from God. Our, pol our politicians are absolutely sick with corruption. They have no fear of God. They have no mind of God. They... they that it's it's unbelievable what our politicians are doing to this country. And um, yes, we're headed for a fall. Uh, could it be saved? It could be if men would re return to God and call on God with a true repentance and godly sorrow. But according to Bible prophecy, it's not going to happen. Um but we could possibly not have as great a fall as what it may be. Anyway, uh, I think that will shake this whole world when America goes down as the strongest nation among the Gentiles. Uh, I had a minister recently saying, I keep hearing Brother Smith saying America's going to fall, but I can't find America in the Bible. We'll keep looking because it's in there. There's no nation been blessed as great as America that God hasn't included in his plan. And you, you probably can't name the 10 kings either, but they're in there. And so there are, uh, uh, this nation is uh, included in the Bible. I won't try to go into all of that now, but then there was judgment, fire, and smoke, and and uh, judgment that came against the mountain. But God wasn't in any of that, not for Elijah. Elijah was in the top of the mountain in a cave. And he just stayed in the cave. He was safe there. That's a picture of the body of Christ, especially in the restoration, restored church. And then he heard a small, still voice. Keep tuning your ears. The Bible said, blessed are they that hear, have ears to hear and eyes to see. Uh, you, you know, we have to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And so it's, it's so important that we watch and pray and that we stay uh, keenly aware of what the Spirit of God is saying to the church and uh, that we can hear 
the voice of God. Jesus said this. He said, no man. How did he say it? He said, my sheep hear my voice and no other voice will they hear. And so it's important that we have ears to hear the voice of the Lord and not some other voice. And that takes experience and learning of the Lord and becoming close enough to him to know his voice when he speaks. And he spoke in a small, still voice and he told Elijah, Elijah to anoint Hazel king over Israel, Jehu, I mean, over Assyria, Jehu king over Israel. And he said to anoint Elisha uh, to be put in your office. And of course, uh, when he came down off the mountain, he met a young man plying with 12 yoke of oxen. That's a picture and type of the Jew. The Jews have been uh, cut off. There's been a great gulf between uh, the, the, the Jew, which was the rich man, and Lazarus, the Gentiles, that parable. And we, we have not been able to get to them, and they haven't been able to get to us. But when the mantle of Elijah touched that young man, he dropped his plow. He, he ran after him. He said, I've got to follow you. And uh, he said, uh, let me go home and kiss my mom and daddy goodbye. That's something when a Jew is willing to give up their rights to Judaism and tell it all goodbye. That's what the apostle Paul did when he saw Christ as the Messiah on the road to Damascus and was blinded. It showed it, it showed how blind he was that the Messiah was right there and he wasn't only rejecting it, he was fighting against it just like the rest of the Jews were. But when God touched him, he saw it and the Old Testament exploded in his mind and he got the message and became the apostle to the Gentiles. Well, in the end of the Gentile world, God's going to graft the Jew back in. Paul said that in Romans 11. He said, we are a wild olive, being a wild olive branch. God uh, grafted us into the tame olive tree. They were a tame olive branch and cut off. Um, and uh, But he said, how much more them being a tame olive branch Will God be able to graft them back in? Well, see, God, uh, those, the Jewish people, uh, Paul said this, he said, that won't happen until the fullness of the Gentiles come. God's been dealing with a different world, a Gentile world for the past 2,000 years to bring us to Christ and make up the remainder of his bride. But just like God dealt 2,000 years of the Jewish people from Abraham to Christ and made up a, a portion of his bride there in the end of the Jewish world in the harvest. Get that. It, it's a harvest in the end of the Jewish world. It'll be a harvest in the end of the Gentile world. I don't know why people have difficult with that. Uh, that's when it's going to take place. And uh, once God... Uh, in, in the last prophetical hour, in the last 15 years of the Gentile world, God's going to make up his bride, the remainder of it, and he will, uh, he will graft the Jews back in. I believe it's, um, is that in, is that in, uh, let's look here at this scripture. Let me see if I can help you with the scripture, if I can, if I can. Let's see if I can give you a scripture I'm looking for. Give me just a second here. Well, I don't 
know if I can. I'm looking for. Is it in? Let me see if it's in Hosea. Yeah, it's in Hosea, the sixth chapter. It says, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he'll bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he'll raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. After two days, um, he goes on and says, uh, when you see him whom, whose side you pierced. Uh, th this two days, Peter said, a day with the Lord's is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. This is a 2,000 year period. That's during the Gentiles. And then once the Jew was cut off, but then God will revive them. He'll, he will graft them back in. And then the third day, they'll know the Lord. That's the thousand year millennial reign. And, uh, and there is where Elisha, the type of Elisha, will come into effect after uh, the Gentile world, it, the harvest is finished. In that last prophetical hour, there will be Jews that will be grafted back in. And think about this. There's not another people. God has held them in the law of Moses the covenant of Abraham, the law of Moses. He has uh, kept them in the prophets. They've studied in that. They've remained in it. And the history of Israel for these 2,000 years that the Lord turned to the Gentiles and cut the Jew off. Uh, the rich man, Lazarus, remember he was, uh, the Lazarus went into Abraham's bosom. That, that just shows the Gentiles was Lazarus and they entered the covenant of God, Abraham's bosom. But the Jew was the rich man that was cut off. And they went into a hellish condition and they in, the, they in the end, they get to a place where they're longing for a, just a touch of water, just touch their tongue with a drop of water. They're going to be that hungry. God will make them hungry for him. And when it's God's time, he will touch them and they will uh, come, in, they'll accept Christ and recognize that their forefathers missed that. And so there'll be a ministry once the bride is made up in the end of the Gentile world, there will be a Jewish ministry. And they're the only people if it wasn't for those people and God's wisdom holding them the way he has and being able to touch their mind and cause them to see like the apostle Paul that the entire old covenant uh, is a revelation of the new covenant. We've often said that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed all of Paul's writings where he wrote from the scriptures of the Old Testament. He saw Christ in, in all of that, and he quoted those scriptures showing that it related to that last uh, prophetical hour or the, the uh, harvest time of the New Testament church in the end of the Jewish world. And so uh, that's going to happen down here just like God touched the Gentiles back there, God's going to touch the Jew down here and he will graft them back in and they will prevent the church from falling away. If it wouldn't, wouldn't be for the Jews, the church would fall away and it'd take another 2,000 years to bring another people to where we are and where we'll be in the uh, end of this world in a restored church but the church won't fall away because uh, if you remember when Elisha followed Elijah and Elijah went across Jordan, he slapped the water with his mantle and it rolled back on a heap. And by the way, that was at harvest time. The waters had overflown. Jo Jordan had overflown her banks. And that's a picture of the 
snow melting in the wintertime, spring coming, and, and all the water running down into all the streams of the mountain and into River Jordan overflowing her banks. And that's a picture of all of religion coming together. The beast system will be a religious system that's going to come together. It's uh, called in the book of Revelation, the image of the beast. See, we've already had, uh, we, we will have already had seven heads of the beast, but there's an eighth head coming and it will become the eighth head after the image of the beast is made up in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelations. And so uh, uh, God is getting the Jew ready. They'll see this like the apostle Paul saw it and they will see it with a full understanding. A sevenfold light will exist in the restored church. The Jews will come in, but they won't have time to make up the become a part of the bride. Probably a few of them will, but for the most part, they won't. And, and then the bride in Christ will rule through that Jewish ministry down through the thousand years. Now, obviously, there's going to be people come in from all different nations and walks of life at that time that is going to, uh, there will be ministers made up. Men will come in, receive the Holy Ghost, and have a gift in the ministry in their lives and join up with that Jewish ministry. So that Jewish ministry really, uh, because they were elect of God uh, and because of the promise of Abraham, God will graft them back in. But being blood Jews really doesn't have anything to do. They will have to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, be born, again, and accept Jesus as their Savior, repent of their sins, be baptized in water, receive the Holy Ghost, like I said, be born again, and they'll have to go through this process of salvation under grace. Uh, the law uh, will have no effect at that time in the restored church. Just the uh, that that was fulfilled of the law in grace uh, that made up the new covenant is what they'll have to uh, adhere to. And so, but they are God's elect uh, for his promise sake. And so God has held them for the very this very purpose. And so Elisha will take the mantle. If you remember when, they, when him and Elijah walked across Jordan on dry shod ground, Elijah looked at him and said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, I want a double portion of what you have. He did not mean I want twice as much as you've got. That would be a greedy spirit. The double portion belonged to the firstborn. He wanted to inherit what Elijah had. And Elijah said, well, you've asked for a hard thing. But he said, if you see me when I'm caught up, he said, if you see me at that time, uh, you'll have what you've asked for. And just as they reached the other side of the River Jordan, a fiery chariot with horses run right at them, and it separated them, one on each side, one on the other. And at that moment, Elijah was caught up. And that fiery chariot did not distract Elisha. He saw him caught up and his mantle fell to the ground, and he went and picked up the mantle. Now, that fiery chariot, no doubt in my mind, represents uh, the Battle of Armageddon, which is the final woe. It's the final uh, vial of the seven vials that's poured out, the final judgment, the end of the Gentile world. The bride is made up in that, and what that's a picture of, it wasn't, it's just a picture. He wasn't literally to see him when he was caught up, but it was, <clears throat> the picture is, is the Jew that's grafted back in and the end of the Gentile world is going to have to see what caused a person to make the bride, what caused a person to reach perfection, 
overcome the Adamic nature and the corruption of the flesh and be, inherit eternal life. That's what he had to see. And he had to have that to have what Elijah, Elijah had. He walked over and picked up his mantle, walked over to the river Jordan, slapped the banks of it and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And it rolled back on a heap and he walked across on dry shod ground and he retraced Elijah's steps. He first went into Jericho. And uh, so here is a picture of this Jewish ministry now in the uh, second book of Kings in the 16th, uh, second chapter, uh, I think probably, uh, you know, the, uh, the sons of the prophet, they saw him come across Jordan like that and they wanted to know where's Elijah. And they said, let us go find him. And he said, no, don't, you don't need to do that. He knew they couldn't find him. He was caught up. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, finally, he felt so ashamed. He said, go ahead. Well, they came back after a period of time. I think there was 50 of them. And they said, we can't find him. He said, I told you not to go. And, uh, but then uh, the, the very first thing that happened after that is um, they came to Elisha and said, look, the water, uh, the ground is barren. And, and uh, uh, how did he say that? Let's see if we can find that here in the second chapter of Kings. Said the men of the city, 19th verse, said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray the situa situation of the city is, ple is pleasant as my Lord saith, but the water is not, and the ground barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise. And he put salt therein, and they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of waters and cast the salt there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more dearth or barren, uh, or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha as he spake. And so, you know, the first thing that happened there, <clears throat> and this is a picture of, of the thousand years starting up, and Elisha and that Jewish ministry, that's what that's a picture of. <clears throat> the first thing is, is that uh, after Armageddon, the condition of the world was so uh, unstable, so uh, the world was shaken in such a way and in such a, a condition that there was little of the Spirit of God uh, it was like, it was barren. People's, everyone was, uh, you know, uh, what can I say? Uh, shaken up with everything that had happened, really, and probably going to be in shock. And, but he put salt, you know, he, Jesus told his disciples, you're the salt of the earth. And that's because they had God. They had the spirit of God and the word of God. Salt is a preservative. And, and it, that ministry is going to have to begin to get things settled down and begin to preserve the things of God and begin to heal the condition of the land and, call, and their anointing and their God working in them is going to begin to bring the spirit of God back among the people. And of course, that's going to start out where they're working. And of course, it will grow down through the thousand years. Think about this. It's took God 6,000 years, 2,000 years in the Antediluvian world. That is the world before the flood. And then from Abraham to Christ, another 2,000 years, the Jewish world. And now we're in 2021. Of course, if, if the battle, if uh, the day of Pentecost uh, which would have been Passover, the beginning of that harvest. Uh, if that was in AD 33, then what? We're in, eight, we're in, we're in 2021. So we're just 12 years away from a 2,000-year world. 
which should mark the end of this world. We're down in the end of God's timing for the Gentiles. That's another reason you can imagine uh, and believe that America, there's going to be a tremendous change. Look at the condition of America. Look at the condition of our government. Look at the condition of our politic, po politicians. You don't don't be foolish enough to think that every you know just because this is the greatest country in the world that it's going to remain. No, you, what you got to understand is this is not depending on man. Just like I'm sure they thought that about Rome too, but it failed, didn't it? And so this nation will fall. God, the, you know, there is going to be a judgment in this world, in the Battle of Armageddon, and there will be a thousand year millennial reign. But what I wanted to show you is, is what it's taken 6,000 years for God to reconcile and making up his bride and finish the work in the Jewish and Gentile world after the judgment of the Antediluvian world, then the Je Jewish world, now the Gentile world. That took 6,000 years to get his bride made up. Look, in 1,000 years, that sounds like a long time, but not compared to six thousand years. In 1,000 years, God is going to clean up the whole world. Every nation will turn to God. Uh, Isaiah said, if you died at the age of 100, you'd be accursed. And uh, there'll be people live the, the, the Garden of Eden uh, is returning back. It'll return back to this world. And finally, after a thousand years, uh, Satan will be bound for a thousand years. There won't be any wickedness. What little bit of wickedness there might be will have to be done in hiding, somewhere in the night, somewhere behind the scenes of things because righteousness is going to prevail and people are going to be judged. Eternal judgment will operate all the way down through the thousand years. And finally, there will be a white throne judgment of the resurrection of the unjust there after the thousand years. And it'll take some time to clean that up, but the world will be cleaned up in the thousand years. Think about that. Christ and his bride ruling and reigning for him for a thousand years is going to have the power. You see, and here's why. Because there's never been a time other than the 45 years of the in the end of the Jewish world and the 15 years in the restored church and the end of the Gentile world that there was enough power to clean the world up enough to make up portions of the bride in the end of those two worlds. But it's going to be a thousand years of a divine operation and divine order of God with a sevenfold light and a ministry that's operating just like the early church and just like the Gentile restored church. And in a thousand years, they'll clean this world up. My Lord, that ought, right there, that ought to make everybody want to be a part of the bride. They ought to be diligent. Everyone ought to be diligent enough to work and labor to be a part of the bride of Jesus Christ because it's available. It's available right now. It's available for God's children to be diligent enough to be, be those that are fortunate enough to be in the bride of Jesus Christ. Those that are living today are living in one of the most fortunate times and the most fortunate time of the Gentile world. <clears throat> and so we're nearing the greatest harvest, godly spiritual harvest that the Gentile world has ever had. And so the first thing this, this Jewish ministry had to do was heal the waters or bring the Spirit of God back into existence to begin to settle the people down and to help them. There were still a great number of the Jews that will reject this Jewish ministry. If you look in uh, the second chapter in the 23rd verse, it says, and he went up from thence unto Bethel. You see, he was in Jericho. That's where Elijah was first in Bethel. Then he had to go to Jericho. Then he had to cross Jordan. Well, and th those are pictures of how the early church, uh, that, and that's talking about down here, 
<clears throat> in the end of the, the Gentile world, but in, in there, those are pictures and types. How remember the Jew had to go into Jericho, uh, had to cross Jordan, go into Jericho, uh, win the battle, uh, first into Bethel. <clears throat> uh, anyway, so he went to Bethel. And he was going up by the way, this is verse 23, and there came forth a little little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, go up thou bald head, go up thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tear 40 and two children of them. Well, <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, I won't take the time to go there and read, but if you'll go to the first chapter of Matthew and look at the generations of the uh, of the ancestry of Christ, showing, you know, the, the lineage of Christ, it shows you that from, uh, from, uh, from Babylon, how does that show that? I may have to go there and look at it. I just have to aggravating when you get my age that you, your memory just not as good as it used to be. But here it is. So all the generations of Abraham to David, that's what I was trying to get at, are 14 generations. And this is verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David into the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away of Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Well, 14 times three is 42. And what this scripture is talking about, these 42 children that, that, were, that were mocking Elisha back in the second chapter of Kings in the 19th verse, <clears throat> saying, go up thou bald head, go up thou bald head. Well, see, the Jew was under the law. That, that's what their hair represented. They were under, they were hairy. They, you know, uh, and that was a representative of them being under the law. But being under grace, remember Paul said in, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, he showed how that a man with long hair was a shame and uh, that he, he, he wasn't to have a covering over his head. Only Christ be his covering. And that's what this is talking about. Go up thou bald head. It's a bald headed ministry without un being under the law or having the covering of the law. They were under, they'll be under the headship of Christ and most of Israel, just like they, re they rejected the law uh, the Lord in the end of the Jewish world, they will reject him again, especially in the beginning. Uh, let me see. Oh, okay. Somebody sent me a question on something else, so I'll, I'll look at that later. Um, and so God... God is going to destroy those. That's a picture that God's going to destroy those that are going to reject those Jews that reject that ministry. They won't all be saved. It'll just be a remnant of them. It's always just a remnant. You know, man in his, uh, in his, in man's wisdom, you know, there's not many noble called, not many wise. Uh, you know, the, the preaching of the cross is foolishness unto the Greeks. Well, you just never will save all of man's fleshly ideology. Uh, he, they just won't all humble themselves before God enough. So now let's go down to the fourth chapter of uh, Second Kings. I'm just going to show you just a few things that this type shows that this Jewish ministry is going to run into in the early parts of this thousand years. I think it's interesting. Uh, he said, now, there cried a woman of certain wives of the sons of the prophet unto Elijah, saying, thy servant, my husband's dead. I, I touched on this in the Bible study recently, but I'll just quickly touch on it again. Said, thou knowest that 
thy servant did fear the Lord and the creditors come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen, to pay their debt. And Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? And tell me, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, thy, man ha thy handmaid hath not, hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And he said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, empty, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shall pour out unto all these vessels and shall set aside that which is full. And of course she did that. And they got all the vessels they could find and kept bringing. She kept taking that one little pot of oil filling up every vessel they brought her. And she finally finished every vessel they brought her. And then she uh, came and told him, said, I did what you said. I've got all these vessels. They're all full of oil. He said, well, now go sell it and pay your debt and live you and your children of the rest, of the rest of the oil that you have. That's just a picture that that ministry is going to begin to, the, that little woman represents the church. Um, her husband was dead. In other words, the, the, that, that ministry didn't have any life, but when it came to this little Jewish ministry that received the mantle of Elijah, and that's this ministry's mantle of their ministry. And they're just, they're going to gather people as many as they can with the anointing and the word of God that they have, and they're going to put oil in those vessels and those saints that they gather. That's, that oil represents knowledge of the word of God. And of course, when the God's anointing touches it, uh, when, when fire touches oil, it becomes light. And, and, and that, he said, that's going to pay your debts. You know, that's going to pay off all of your debts and all of your sins when you uh, when you get all of this and when you go and sell this gospel uh, and then you can live, you'll live on the gospel that you've got. And so she did what he said. Then uh, verse eight said, it fell a day that Elisha passed to Shunem. There was a great woman. She constrained him to eat bread. Well, she told her husband, said, look, said, let's make a little chamber for this guy. This is a prophet of God. And let's set up for him a bed and a table and a stool and candlestick. And it'll be when he comes to us, he'll turn into here. Well, this, this is showing that this Jewish ministry is going to begin to develop a church, the body of Christ. And, you know, that's what the bed represents. It represents a resting place the church where you can get rest for your souls and the candlestick, a, a seven, there's there's the sevenfold light, the operation of God it always operates in the church where the gathering of the people shall be. The gathering of uh, uh, God's people and uh, or where the eagles are gonna gather, Jesus said. And so, uh, and this woman, uh, uh, it came to it came when uh, Gehazi, Elisha's servant, called this little woman and stood before him, and and Elisha said, uh, "Say to her, what you've been careful for us? What is what can we do for you?" And she told him, she said, well, my husband is old and I don't even have a child. And, and, uh, and so he told her, said, about this time next year, you're going to have a man child. You're going to have a son. And that's a picture that there's, that ministry is going to develop a fivefold ministry uh, in that thousand years. It's going to take a while for after Armageddon for this ministry to get off, get off the, uh, get off the, what would I say, the runway for us, so to speak, and get this, uh, the work of God really beginning to flourish through, flourish through the land. And, uh, 
So she did. She had a son. Uh, there, that ministry produced, it began to produce a ministry in the beginning of that work in that uh, thousand years. And that boy went out with his father during, uh, to the reapers. See, it was harvest time. Let me tell you something. Down through the thousand years, it's going to be harvest time all the time. <laughs> the harvest is going to continually grow because the, the season. It, you know, I've, I've been over in the Dominican Republic where the, it's closer to the sun. When the first time I went over this woman, she, she took me up on the, uh, on the top floor of her house and we went out on the roof. It was just a, you know, like a patio. And she had a, a plant out there. And that plant was an okra plant. And there was okras growing on it. And this was in February. And I said to her, I said, well, when do you plant? When do you know to plant, uh, you know, uh, for fruit or for vegetables? She said, when do you want them? Because they can grow them anytime over there, just about. Uh, you just, you know, put, plant your tomato plant. It'll put out tomatoes because it's, it's in the 80s every day over there. <clears throat> it's tropical weather. Well, it's going to be a season that there, it's going to bring forth a continual harvest. This little boy, he went out of his daddy's to the reapers. And while they were out there, he grabbed his head. He said, my head, my head. And uh, his uh, father said, carry this boy to his mother. They took him to his mother and she, she, uh, she went up and laid him on the bed. Uh, of the man of God and shut the door on him. And she called her husband and she said, send me a young man. And she said, take me to the man of God. And so they, they, took, they took her to the man of God. And here's some amazing things about it. This is a beautiful picture. This boy, he was, he was saying, my head, my head. Let me tell you something, when God begins to deal with you, especially when God begins to deal with a man uh, for his ministry, God will begin, to, God, God's going to remove your head, your headship. You're going to have to learn how to be beheaded for Christ's sakes. Just like those that made up the bride in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelations, uh, there's a death going to take place of your headship. You're going to have to learn how to make Jesus Christ your head. There's a ministry that's going to be developed in the beginning of that thousand years. And that little boy was on the bed of the man of God, that Jewish ministry, and he died there. Uh, and But when this woman, she went to get this man of God because she didn't want to lose her son. And when she got to him, he said, uh, uh, he sent his son, I believe. Let me read the 25th verse of 2 second, Kings 2. I'm sorry. Yeah, 2 Kings 4, 25. So she went and came unto the man of God, the Mount Carmel, and it came to pass when the son of God saw her afar off that she said to Gehazi, his servant, behold, yonder is the Shulamite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her. And she said, uh, um, and, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with thy child? Look at her answer. It is well. Her, her son was laying there. She knew that he was laying on his deathbed. But her faith, See, God's going to raise up faith. That ministry, I'm talking about the power of God, the demonstration of God that was in the early church that will be in the restored church in the end of the Gentile world is going to be with that Jewish ministry and it's gonna, it is going to promote faith in those that God deals with in the beginning back there to get what it's going to take to go down through that thousand years. Remember, the bride members are going to be working with Christ to help him accomplish these things. And this woman, 
She had faith in her heart. She said, it is well. There's not very many women with their son laying on a deathbed that could say that without God really touching them. Well, he sent his servant Gehazi on to go, go check on this boy. And then he took the woman himself back. And so <clears throat> when they got there, uh, Elisha's servant told him, he said, the child's not awake. And when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and lay upon his, Elisha's bed. And he went in, therefore, and shut the doors up upon them and prayed to the Lord. Verse 34, and he went up and laid upon the child and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hand. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up. He went up again and he stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened up his eyes. Then he mm -hmm. called Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. So he called her, <clears throat> and when she was coming to the, unto him, he said, take up thy son. This, this is a beautiful picture. That ministry, that Jewish ministry, Elijah, she, he, he laid upon him. He stretched himself on him. He put his mouth on his mouth. He gave him the message of the word of God that he had in his mouth. That's the voice of God that's in this earth and his eyes upon his eyes. He, he gave this young ministry a vision, the exact same vision he had and hands, his hands on his hands. A five-fold ministry will be established in that uh, early part of that thousand years by this Jewish ministry, and he stretched himself on the child. Two times he did. He gave, he stretched himself upon him and gave him everything the early church, Jewish world ministry had, the 12 apostles, and that the, the restored church and the Gentile church had, because they will need every bit of that and know the history of all of God, what God has done to be able to accomplish what needs to be accomplished down through the thousand years. That child sneezed seven times. That The breath, life of the Holy Ghost uh, came into that. It'll come into that ministry in its fullness of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes I wonder if we're not going to have, we're going to have to have more of the Spirit of God than we've got today in the restored church. This ministry down through that time is going, God is going to do so many awesome things. When I talk about this and think about this, I think, God, I want to, I want to be in the bride because I want to see all of this. I want to watch it into operation. I want to see what God is going to do. I don't want to sleep for a thousand years. <coughs> in the grave. You can't praise God in the grave. There's no knowledge in the grave, the Bible says. I want to be a part of the bride and be a part of those that, uh, and if we're diligent, it's what Peter said in 2 Peter 1. He said, give all diligence to make your, your election, calling and election sure. And he gave him eight things. He said, if you'll do these things, you'll never fall and so shall an entrance be made unto you in the everlasting kingdom of our God and his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So then look, the next things, next thing takes place. They come from Belshalisha and, and, and brought the man of God bread, a first fruits, 20 loaves of barley full of ears of corn and the husk thereof. That's not talking about corn like we think of corn. It was talking about the barley that was in the kernel of the stalk that they brought the full ears from the harvest. The first fruits came in. And, and the man of God said, give it to the people that they can eat. 
and the servitor or the server or, or the minister, uh, his servant, he said, what? Should I set this before a hundred men, this little dab of, and, and, and he said, give it to them. And therefore, say, thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. And he set it before them and they did eat and left thereof according to the word of God. It's just showing that that ministry, that first fruits in the beginning of that, that harvest of that thousand year uh, millennial reign is going to be so amazing that when they have their, that first fruits of that first harvest in that world, that you could just take a little bit of it and begin to break it and give it to everyone that's hungry for it. And it won't look like it's enough for all of them. But when you begin to break the word of God, it just begins to grow and grow and grow and people begin to receive it and they can't eat all of it. It's just, it's just more than they can contain in their thinking and in their understanding. But yet it's the blessed anointed word of God and they, they won't be able to uh, attain all of it in the beginning, there'll always be some left over. There always is, even in the early church, even in the divine order of God, you cannot exhaust the, the goodness and the glory of the word of God and the breaking of it up uh, for you to discern spiritually. Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Well, uh, I, maybe I could go on and say a little bit more about Elisha, but I just thought I might say something about this early work of this Jewish ministry that's going to receive a double portion or the inheritance, exactly what Elisha had. And to see that ministry and this, these types go forth and begin to work in that world after Armageddon, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be uh, a great, glorious work that's going to take place down through there. That ought to make us all want to be a greater part of it. Well, um, it's sure been good visiting with you. I know I'm, I was having to kind of hurry my way through. And, um, you know, uh, so that I'd have time to say everything I've said. <clears throat> but... Um, I want to thank all of you for uh, being with me this evening. Give me an opportunity to talk to you. Um, I see just several people. Sister Layton, God bless your heart. It's always good to have you on here with us. Sister McNabb, uh, Brother Pacheco from the Philippines, uh, Brother Wren, God bless your heart. Um, let's see. Well, there's just... Uh, maybe I better quit naming everybody's names, but Brother Fidel from Guatemala, Guatemala City in Guatemala. God bless all of you. Thank you once again for being with, with me. Uh, have a good weekend this weekend. Go to church, worship God, be faithful, read your Bible. Do everything that's needed to be a part of this last great work in the end of the Gentile world that's going to come about. Hope I said something here tonight to encourage you and cause you uh, to uh, to want to continue. You know, uh, the patience of the Lord. That word patience in the Bible means endurance, to endure. Blessed are they that endure temptations. You, you can't give up, saints. You, you can't look back. You got to look forward for what God has for all of us. Uh, what's impossible with man, remember, is possible with God. You pray for me, and I'll pray for you. God bless.